Good morning, good morning. I pray that you all are doing well. I am Hamp Lee III, pastor of Village Hills Fellowship, and we just want to welcome you to our Sunday message. I pray that all is going well for you all. Uh, today, as you know, to see the title, we're going to talk about how can I forgive someone who hurt me? And this is a very, very, very important message because I believe uh, unforgiveness is probably one of Satan's secret weapons and most deadliest of weapons are most secret and the most deadliest of weapons. And you think about unforgiveness and, and his desire to keep people separated from God for eternity. He doesn't have to have to cause you or, or tempt you to rob a bank or, or molest children or do some other illegal, immoral or unethical uh, action. I just need to put someone that hasn't healed from their pains to come in their life because hurting people hurt people. And I just need to put that person in your life because sooner or later, they're going to hurt you. And when they hurt you, it may cause bitterness, upset, or some type of anger within you to where you don't want to forgive them. And then if you don't want to forgive them, then guess what? God's not going to forgive you either. So this is so important because there's a lot of times we live with unforgiveness for years. I mean, we sit on it, we rest on it, we try to put it in a box and hide it away somewhere in the recesses in the abyss of our minds. We hope there was a black hole we could put it in, but it just doesn't work like that. And the unforgiveness that we have toward one person, the, our experiences from that situation, that moment, it spills over into all of our, all of our other, uh, relationships and connections and whether father, mother, you know, coworker, boss, wherever is going to spill over into that. And it's going to affect us because now you're the one that's hurt and hurting people that don't work out their situation to forgive and root out all the bitterness and anger and frustration they have, they begin to hurt others. And I saw this quote along with that this week was that free people, free people. So that's been the goal for our message. This um, the last couple of messages, just really speaking about freedom. And I know this is something God's been dealing with me about with freedom. And so we wanna continue to open and unpack this message on freedom. But before I do, I want to share a few uh, announcements that we have. I've been sharing just our messages here about some of the things we have going on. We are going to start up our Bible study and our men's meeting this week. And then today we have our women's meeting at 2 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. So those are some changes. So if you would like to, probably within the first 30 seconds of our announcements, we have our um, our message on the Bible study. There's going to be a QR code and you can download a free book. It's going to be this book right here, uh, Advancing the Kingdom. And so this is a book that I wrote uh, when I started pastoring, probably was that maybe nine years ago. That was a long time ago, nine years ago in Germany. And uh, so we'll go over that book, but it's going to go over some of the I won't say basics, but some of the foundational things about the Bible. So that's what we're going to talk about on Wednesday about the Bible and how it's constructed and kind of give you a, a, a overview, a summary of the Bible and some, some of the storylines that's in the Bible. And this one story of God's greatest love, this greatest love story that he shares with us. So I want to be able to share that message with you. And then also, uh, so you can download the book for free. It's a free PDF. You don't have to pay for anything. If you'd like to purchase a hard copy, then there's a, an opportunity to do so, but we won't provide that. Um, but we do want to provide you at least with a free copy. So with that, I'm going to share the announcements and then we'll jump into uh, our message. So let me share that with you here.
Amen. Amen. I so appreciate you joining us uh, today. And so those are some of our announcements. We would definitely like to begin uh, having more uh, connections and meet up here locally in Prattville. So we're working toward having a maybe a, a, a coffee, Christ and coffee discussions. And so we're, we're working toward that. Our desire is to have physical services, Lord willing, in the fall of 2022. And But I know for us, our mandate was to start a church or have a church building when the pandemic ends. And God told me several months ago that the pandemic wasn't open and it wasn't over. Even though I saw people coming, you know, uh, going out more and taking masks off, God said the pandemic wasn't over. I think we see that now. So we're just going to continue to hold fast and we want to be um, safe. We want to be respectful of others and also having opportunities to connect with you. So right now we're connecting through uh, Facebook, but then Lord willing in smaller gatherings, be able just to connect with others because our, our desire really is for discipleship and really wanting to connect with others and, and to be able to walk together along a journey of discipleship so we can grow because that's where we believe for Village Hills Fellowship. That's where we believe the greatest connection is because we are very committed to fulfilling the Great Commission. That's very important to make disciples of all nations, not church attenders. We're making disciples and that's our desire and goal. So we want to build a structure that fulfills that and we want to be obedient to the vision that God's given us. So we appreciate the patience that you have with us. I think as I was sharing a little bit earlier, because we're on Zoom and Facebook, so I was sharing on Zoom that it's been a uh, this process has been more about my own self-discovery, understanding more about myself, about what I believe, and being able to communicate that clearly. And those are the things that we're working on as we connect with other church planners and a church planning network. So we're going through a cohort that has various classes and things. So we're reaching out with others that are also on the same journey as us so that we can be effective in reaching uh, this local city and others and you around the world to be able to reach you with the message of Jesus Christ, with his love, with his powerful transformation that we all can experience through uh, the sacrifice that he's given. So we just uh, thank you for your time and patience and walking with us. So today we're going to talk about how can I forgive someone who hurt me? And as I said earlier, this is probably Satan's one of his greatest, most secret and most deadliest weapons. And we want to clear this off because in Matthew 6, 14 and 16, I got to get my Bible. Hold on. Uh, I got to get my Bible. So in Matthew 6, sometimes I just like to turn the pages. I don't really want to search, uh, go through my app. I just like to, to turn the pages. But in Matthew 6, you look at 14 and, and 15. He says, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. So we believe it's so important to forgive people. And sometimes a lot of us, we're living and dealing with hurt from decades, I'm talking about the hurt, like somebody could be in their 50s and they experienced something in their childhood and they've never forgiven that person. Even though that person may be dead and gone, they've been gone for years, but the unforgiveness has remained and it kept them chained from living a life of complete and total freedom. Jesus came that we may be free there to live a, an abundant life. And to do that, to live the abundant life, this is in like, so this is almost a version of living your best life ever. And it's not living the best life as in I got all this money and cars and riches and all these things, but I'm living the life that God has given me and I'm free. I don't have to wake up with worries and wake up mad, wake up angry, wake up with anxiety, hurting people and snapping at folks. I can be at peace. I have joy. The fruit of the spirit is active within my life. Th that life. Because he's come to free us. We have victory through Christ and we can walk in victory every single day of our lives. So this is why we want to really talk about some of these messages that God's been dealing with me about that. And for my season of my life right now, it's about being free. I want to be in free and I want to walk in freedom. Like even for my wife and I, we're, we're going to work on vision boards at some point in our lives. We did go to Hobby Lobby, purchase some items. So someday, we're, maybe it'll be for our next week. Uh, our, our date night, but have maybe the destiny date night. Come on, somebody. Destiny dating. So we talked about that, but having a destiny date night where we begin to put together our vision board. And for me, my, my word for the year for 2021 is joy. 
And so I've really been meditating on James 1, 2 through 4 about what it means to be joyous in the midst of diverse temptations, in the midst of difficult seasons, because having joy is not based on what we experience. It's not based on those experiences, but it's based on a perspective and a position that we take in Christ and that in spite of what goes on around me, I can still have joy. So with that, Let's go into today's message. I've been talking for 10 minutes already, so let's get started. But today, when we're talking about the freedom to forgive, I want, or freedom to forgive, that was the original title, but it's how can I forgive someone who hurt me? I want to read from Matthew 18, verses 21 to 35. So I will read all of these verses, and then we're going to break it down. I got four points that I'm going to look over. So I'll give you a moment to get your Bible. I'll see if there's any questions. I don't see, see any questions here, but we're going to read from Matthew 18, 21 to 35. Please get out your Bibles. You don't have to stand. You're in the house. You can still show honor to God. Honor God by your life and your living. This is my personal perspective. You can stand. You can stand for God when you're reading the word, but not respect him any other place. Now, come on. And you're sitting down on the word everywhere else. So let's let's be able to show God by our actions that we honor him. As the word says, if you love him, you obey him. And let's show him our love and respect for him by how we take care of those he's placed in our in our community and the ones that he's connected us with. Amen for that. So with that, let's go to Matthew 18, 21, verse 21 says, then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him till seven times. Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee seven times, but until 70 times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. But for us so much, he had not to pay. His Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshiped him saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. And But that same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants which owed him a hundred pence and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat and saying, pay me that, that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him saying, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. But he would not, but he went and cast him in the prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came untold unto their Lord all that was done. Then the Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Should have not thou also had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall, this is verse 35, so likewise shall my heavenly father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. I pray that the Lord will bless all the readers, the hearers, and the doers of his word. So as I said before, unforgiveness may be one of Satan's uh, greatest and, and most deadliest and most secret weapons. And, and, and so today I just want to give some exposure to that because we want to do away with that and provide four ways that we can find forgiveness for those who hurt us. So number one that I want to share with you is that freedom begins with truth. Freedom begins with truth. And so this is in the verses 23 and 24. So when we look at that, he, uh, there was a point when the Lord began the, the um, is like the king that began to reckon unto him and he began to uh, take account of all his servants, right? So what we find here is that we have to get down to the brass tacks of things. We have to be able to settle down and say, okay, what's going on with what's in my heart? What's going on with this relationship? And oftentimes when we are experiencing a troubling or a situation of unforgiveness, we are filled with emotion over what happened. And that 
is oftentimes the struggle. So we don't want to go back to a situation of unforgiveness because it's too painful to think about. Because we start thinking about it, we get angry, we get mad, we get upset, and it's like, okay, I don't want to deal with it no more. I'm going to put this thing away. But in order for us to begin to walk on this path of freedom, we have to begin to deal with what happened and the situation of why maybe someone did something to us and begin to think about the circumstances minus or absent from the emotion. The emotion is uh, emotions are like being drunk. You lose inhibitions and you, you normally will say and do things that you normally wouldn't say and do. So you have to be able to sit down with truth in a manner that leaves you um, that's devoid or excludes any type of emotion to be able to think of this and to be able to settle down. And this takes maybe some time, some prayer to ask God, look, I'm struggling with this, but I'm going to tell you why it's really, really important. Because even when when God was dealing with me about forgiving my father in the 90s, that I God just told me, keep thinking about my father. Even though I didn't talk to him, God kept telling me, think about your father. And I was thinking about the truth of things that he did. I was thinking about the things he did, not just the bad things, but just who he was based on what he said. And so you think about any pathway to truth, it, when any pathway to freedom, excuse me, lead, has to begin with truth. This is for any area of struggle. This is any area of trauma. And this is areas for deliverance. It begins with truth. And so we struggle with that because sometimes in our circumstances and situations, is we're upset because we had a relationship with someone and we expected them to do something and they didn't do that. So because they didn't meet our expectations, we're often we're mad for what they did, but we're even more mad because they didn't meet an expectation. Often that expectation is something that they didn't even know that was on them. I'm expecting you because you're my spouse to live a certain way. I'm expecting you because you're my children. You're going to behave this way or because I'm expecting because I'm paying you for a service that you're going to give me excellent, you know, you're going to give me excellent service in response. And those things don't happen. So then when they don't happen, we get mad because our expectations not met. It's not always just about what they're doing. It's added on because you didn't meet something that I dreamt of. I had a vision for how something was going to be done or be accomplished. It wasn't. I'm mad. I'm mad because what I was expecting or how I was expecting to be treated, I wasn't. It was less than that. I was expecting that. That's why people get, that's why church hurt hurts so much. Like there, some people say there ain't no hurt like church hurt. Why? Because I'm expecting that of all the people in the world, the pastor or the people that's in a church, they are going to be the ones that's going to love me most. I'm expecting that the, pa the pastor is going to treat me in a certain way and to be kind. And then when they're not, I'm devastated. I'm rocked and I'm crushed. But if someone in the streets, Mr. Joe Blow or some coworker did the same thing, we may not be as mad. But sometimes we, we put these expectations over certain people and positions. And because of that, when they when they may may break a uh, one thing that we thought of that they'll do or they violate something that we thought that they would accomplish, then we get upset. And then it causes us and spirals us out of control sometimes in our emotions, our heart, because we're expecting something that didn't happen. And this is why I talked about about when I spoke a couple weeks ago about overcoming the enemy in your house. Oftentimes, we, if, if your enemy is your spouse or your children, I have an expectation that you're going to do something. Oftentimes, maybe because I'm good to you, you're going to be good to me. But I'm good to you and you're not good to me. So I got a problem because expectations. So some of us have to move away from those expectations because those expectations are not founded in truth. They're not. This is something that we have designed have placed on somebody else, often those people don't even know that they have an expectation being placed over them. They don't even know that. They're living their lives, but all the while, we got our checklist out like this, you know, checking off, like, okay, you're doing that, okay, all right, you, yep, 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 all right, you, you're meeting that, well, you're not meeting one of my goals, so then you get mad at them, and then you want to say something to them, why? Because they're not meeting your expectation, come on, y'all. If you take a moment to think about that, we even treat our friends like that. You treat, if you was dating, you treating your, your, this person you're dating. We have these expectations we're putting on people because we have a vision for how something should go. We have a vision for how our family should be. We have a vision for how our relationship should be. We have a vision for how our work is going to be. We have a vision for how my relationship, hanging out with the boys, hanging out with the girls, how that's going to be. And when it doesn't meet that, we have a problem. So we have to be able to deal with those expectations. 
Because we have to understand that in order for us to get to the place of truth, we got to know what, where we are. And this is just like dealing with a GPS. When you go into a GPS, you're in the middle of the city and then you're like, okay, well, I need to get to the edge of the city. Then, you know, you just can't say punch in the edge of the city. No, GPS needs to know where you're starting from. You need to know where you're at. The same thing in Christ. We need to be able to identify very, God know where we at. Sometimes we need to know where we are and to be able to call things as they are. And as I shared with you before about the situation, my dad, my, my father just wanted, uh, my, uh, the Lord just wanted me just to think about my father. There was a situation where I didn't like the way that he was treating his, his, his daughters, his, my sisters, and I had a problem with it. And I had tucked it in. I mean, it was like four years. I mean, it was maybe four or five years plus or more. And I just kind of, I forgot about it. I'm chilling one day. I'm literally, I'm in Japan looking outside my patio window. And as I'm looking out the window, God says, Hamp, you need to forgive your father. And I'm like, what? You know, it was something I pushed down. I pushed away. And I'm like, Lord, what are you talking about? Forgive my father for what? What happened? You know, he's like, no, forgive him for what he did to your sisters. Now, how you felt about that? My expectation. I had a very specific expectation that I was, I was hoping and looking for my father to do. And he didn't do it the way I thought I was expecting him to. So I was mad. But I pushed it away. I didn't know that. So God said, Ham, I need you to understand. I want you to think about your father. Every day, I want you to keep thinking about your father, no matter how painful it is. So I thought about who he was. I thought about what he did. And, and I just kind of continued to go that way. I, I wanted to hear his voice about that. And this is the second point, that we must be willing to hear or learn the other person's story. This is very difficult for a lot of us if you're acting in just emotion alone. Because we have to begin to put some cognitive understanding toward what's going on. We need to think about what has been done to us. We need to think about what's been done to them. Oftentimes, as I said, hurting people hurt people. Anybody that will not yield completely and entirely to Jesus has the potential to hurt another person. Any of us, as in, including me, if I am not yielded to God in any specific area for any specific reason, I have the, the, the capability to hurt another person. Hurt people hurt people. That's why it's important to continue to humble ourselves and to crucify our flesh because our flesh want to rise up and it wants to come against people that's hurt us and do different things. So it's super important. So I have to be willing to learn the other person's story. But when we're hurt, we make it all about us. We, we are not going to stop to try to figure out what somebody else did. I'm not trying to figure out what you did. You the one that hurt me. You need to fix it. Come on. That's how we normally are. And we walk away. We don't even remotely try to think about what the other person does. But when we think about this situation, about learning about the story about other people, this is even like understanding that sometimes, and, and this is kind of going over my next point, but sometimes people are operating in ignorance. Sometimes people have been abused. They've been hurt. And so they're, they're, they're specifically only operating out of their hurt and pain. Now, does it, does not excuse or saying, I'm going to, I'm going to overlook what a person's done? Yes, they have hurt me. Yes, they have done something. But sometimes the basis and the reason for that is not just because they just, they just evil people. A lot of people are just hurting and, and they're speaking out of their hurt. They don't have another way to be able to communicate. They don't know a different way. Sometimes people act in ignorance and they've been taught that way. Sometimes you think about racism and certain things. Some of those things are learned at home. Those are, are behaviors that are learned in the house. You know, we don't, we're not, we're not raised. We're not born racist. We're, we're not born to hate somebody else simply because of the color of their skin. We just want to play with people. We want to play with kids just because they're kids on the outside. We don't even think about that. Those separations and divisions and hatred begin because it's being taught. So those are things somebody's being taught. So now they're being taught to have a certain perspective. Now, they now at some point, it does need to change. Now, they have a responsibility to do that. But then I have to understand that maybe this person was taught that way and they would experience trauma or they experienced something else that that it caused them to be who they are. And this is why it's so important to have the why. This is beginning to operate in self-control. This is why the Bible talks about girding the loins of your mind, being self-controlled. Right. So then when I'm self-controlled, I'm not operating out of my emotions. I'm able to sit back and, and have this opportunity to look at a perspective with empathy. 
right? Because empathy here is understanding the feelings or perspective of, a, of another person. And so when I can understand that, it, it brings greater clarity. Maybe someone was abused as a child. And so you think about that, somebody that may have been abused as a child goes out to abuse other people. And we see that. So then, but there's a work that has to be done that that person has to do. They may not have done the work to be able to say, okay, it stops with me. I'm not going to hurt nobody else. I was hurt, but I have to take responsibility. It's not, it's not my fault for what happened to me, but it is my responsibility to do something with it once something's happened to me. That make sure that I don't go out to harm and hurt another person. That is my responsibility. And I have to do the work. So now in my season, when you're talking about being free, I want to do the work. Because free people, free people. So if I'm hurting and there are some areas of my life that I'm still hurting in, then if I don't deal with those things, then I'm going to wind up hurting other people. So I'm trying to do my work. And sometimes it's not easy. It's not, these are things, they're, they're not easy on the flesh. But they're, they're possible with God. And that's why we got to keep going to him for help. That's why we got, Lord, I want to forgive. I'm struggling. Father God, I hate this person and I don't ever want to see him again. But I know what your word says. Your word, but if I want to see you, then I need to forgive them and I'm struggling. I need some help. Father, teach me, help me. If that's all you say right now, Father, help me. I, I want to, I want to forgive, but I'm struggling. This person did these things to me and it was painful and it was real and I felt it. But I, I, but I need to find a way, Lord, help me to do that. So that's why it's important to understand what a person has been through. Because when we begin to understand why what a person's been through, then it may make, make sense in the sense that I understand why you did what you did to me. I don't agree with it. Come on now. I may not agree with it, but I understand why you did it. And that's helped me tremendously to forgive. It helped me tremendously to forgive people, right? So this means I got to be quick to listen, right? It talks about this in James 119, to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. I got to listen. I got to listen for the story. So when we go back to the parable, you know, he was taking accounts of everybody. I'm trying to get everybody's story. I'm trying to figure out what's the story, how much money you owe me, what's going on. So then he's when he's bringing the servant in, like, look, you know, look, he could have just simply said, look, you know what? That servant owed me, you know, 10,000 talents. He ain't going to be able to pay it in a lifetime. Put him in jail. I'm done. I ain't even talking with him. No, come on in. Come on in, homie. Let's have a talk. <laughs> That's the ham version. So come on in. Let's have a talk real quick. So then we talk about it. Then I begin to understand because there may be more to the story, kind of like Paul Harvey. Now, and now the rest of the story. And that's so important. It's important in the military. I always talk. I was talking about this last couple of weeks. We was in training classes and it's always about getting the rest of the story, because in some of the positions I had, no situation was the same on the surface. On the surface, it seemed like a, a, an airman in distress. And, and if you go out and run out to try to help them, as soon as you jump out and you start to engage in that, like, I'm trying to help this airman out, then you find out that really they was they was the one that was wrong. And you now now you're helping somebody that was in the wrong. And so now it makes you look like you was you was in the wrong. And one, you didn't do your due diligence. So before I go out jumping out, asking and jumping into action, I'm quick to listen. I start asking questions. I want to find out what's going on. I want to understand the whole story. I may not use everything that's in that whole process, but it's going to help me get a clearer picture. Because a lot of times we operate like this. So I can't see what's on my right hand side, your left. I can't see what's on my on my left side, your right. I can't see that because I'm not looking. I can't see. So when I begin to ask questions and understand the story, I begin to see clearly. I can see what's going on. And that's important for all of us to begin to do, to understand the specific background of what's going on around us. Now, for the situation with my father, I didn't have the opportunity to just talk to him about it. I didn't call him. During this whole process, never talking to my father, but I thought about who he was and what he was trying to do and the things that he was that he was trying to do, even in those situations that he wasn't meeting my expectation for how I believe he should have treated his own children. So I was like, if those are my children, I'd have treated them a certain way. So I was upset with that. But then I had to I had to come to the situation and, and, and get to a perspective. But I had to get out of my emotions to be able to do that. I couldn't be emotional about trying to think about my father and trying to be obedient to what God said. And that's important for all of us. I get a drink of water. So number three is I'll share this and then I'm going to take my drink of water. But number three is allow their truth 
to lead you to compassion. I pray that y'all doing well. I don't see any questions here. Okay, so number three, allow their truth to lead you to compassion. So in the parable, you know, the, the, the king listened to his story and he, he was moved. It said in verse 27 that he was moved with compassion and he loosed him and forgave him of the debt. And so then sometimes when we understand, when we begin to sit down and say, OK, you know, this person was hurt in their childhood. It didn't have nothing to do with me. I wasn't there. But it does give evidence for why this person has a series of behaviors that acts in a certain way. So because they're hurt, they haven't processed their hurt and pain. And a lot of us do that. A lot of us, when you deal with some other people, they're just hurt. They're just hurt about something else. Sometimes it's not even about you. You may have done something to stir that thing up. And sometimes we push it a little bit further. But oftentimes, you know, it's, it's founded in a pain and hurt that that's that's connected to something that you've done or the experience that the two of you are sharing there. So I have to make this complete, this, this decision by separating myself from the, from the emotion. That's super important. And as I said, some people act in ignorance. So when you think about like Jesus, when he said, forgive them for they know not what they do, they're crucifying him. But the thing was, was that it was a secret as far as what Jesus purpose was on the earth. That he was coming to save men for the sins. That through his death would bring forth salvation for the world. That was not known. So they were operating in ignorance. And it says this in Acts. Let me read real quick. In Acts um, 3, 17 and 18. So even though they had committed an action. Well, let me read them all. So Luke 23 and 34. Let me go there first. I appreciate my wife. She... She is diligently uh, writing and she's just serving and I appreciate her. Um, so in, in Luke, right, Luke, uh, Luke 23, 30, uh, 33, I'll read 33. It says, and when they had come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the male factors and, all, and one on the right hand and the other on the left. Jesus said, forgive them, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment. So now they're in a situation where they're they're crucifying him, but they don't know why they're doing it. They're doing it in ignorance. Because in Acts 3, 17 and 18, <coughs> excuse me. Acts 3, 17 and 18, um, it says here, and now, brethren, I want that thou, I want that through ignorance ye did it, as did your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he have so fulfilled. So they are operating out of ignorance. And there's some people that are operating strictly out of ignorance. Did they do something? Yes. Were they crucifying? Yes. But now they're being forgiven because they're acting out of ignorance. They don't understand and know what's going on. Some people, as I said a little bit earlier, are taught and trained to behave in a certain way. As I said in the, in the house, that's why we're we're so diligent about love rules. And, and Lord willing, we just hired we're hiring a social media uh, strategist and to help us out. So we're launching. You see crazy stuff. We got boxes everywhere and helping us. Right. And sometimes we're taught a certain way and we wanted to really with love rules to deal with families. Really being able to teach, talk, to talk, teach, and display God's love. That's what we're here to do, to help families do that. Because I believe when we can improve the lives of, uh, of families, then we can uh, improve our communities, our city, our state, and our, and our nation. So that's where we're going with that. So sometimes people are taught in a specific way. Sometimes people experience something that is significantly uh, damaging to them, uh, something traumatic, but it's also uh, unresolved. And it's unaddressed. So we, we operate in these areas when it's unresolved and redressed. So we have these trauma. So then um, though they commit these acts, as I said, the source that they have may not be a godly uh, origin for some people. And so, as I said, you may not agree why someone's acted the way they did, or maybe they're guilty of doing it. But you might see the hurt that they experienced in their life or the ignorance that they acted through. Now, again, as I said, this doesn't condone or excuse what they did, but it gives clarity and truth. 
So then we come to a place where we have to say to ourselves, am I going to separate my emotions from from uh, from the truth? Because the emotions try to overcome that It tries to overcome it so that all it does is swallows it up. Think about it. I want you all to think about when there was a time you haven't. Most of us have lived long enough to where we've experienced a moment of unforgiveness or someone's challenged it or try to bring it on. And you feel like that this is truth and this is feelings. Feelings try to like cover it up. They want to cover it up. You will not get out. The truth will not get out. But when the truth gets out, then the then when the feelings get off of it and I remove it, then I have the chance to be free. So that I don't walk around like this. Most of us are walking around with a fist. We're ready to punch everybody because we're mad. Right. But then when because the, we've got the feelings on it, and it's covering it. And I want to punch everybody. But when I can take the feelings away from that, now I'm free. I want to live free. And I hope you do, too. So with this situation and number four is being able to make a decision to forgive from the heart. This is what Jesus talked about. Forgiving from the heart is super important. So excuse me one second. So when we talk about forgiving from the heart, the heart is the center of your thoughts and emotions, the center of it. And that's just as you think about in Proverbs. You know, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. That's why it's really important to really think about, to really ensure that we're always inventorying what was in our heart. What we think about ourselves and others from the heart, the center. And as I said, forgiveness, when you want to, well, I didn't say this earlier, but forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is a decision. When you make the decision to forgive, your feelings will follow. I have to make, listen to me. You make a decision to forgive and mean it. Come on, y'all. Same thing. You may make a decision. Think about the times you've been mad or uh, I used to think of maybe, maybe a day when somebody cut you off and then you're sitting there like, you know what? This person cut me off. And normally when they cut you off, you get mad. You want to chase them down. You want to, you know, you want to look at them and roll rage. But then you're like, you know what? The, the birds are chirping outside. It's a nice day. It's payday. Come on, somebody. Today's a good day. I don't even feel like bothering with that today. I ain't even going to get mad. What happens when you make that decision not to get mad? Everything, your the emotions come down. Everything like, everything begins to simmer down. Why? You made a decision. You made a decision and the feelings respond. It's the same thing with unforgiveness. It's the thing about unforgiveness, though. Those feelings are going to be a lot stronger because they're connecting. Oftentimes, some of that hurt that we have is connected to the expectation. They're connected to somebody else that hurt us, right? And we ain't resolved that because somebody else hurt us in the same manner that somebody else hurt us. So we're connected to those things. So we got to get all that stuff out. Because forgiveness is not a feeling. If you are waiting to feel like you're in a good space to forgive, you're going to be waiting a long time. And don't wait till you're dead because it's too late. It's a decision. It's not a feeling. You're going to be waiting a long time. You're waiting to feel it. You make a decision. And this is where the difficulty comes in for a lot of us. Because a lot of us, even though we read in scriptures, come on, let's just be honest here for a second. Even though we read in scriptures about crucifying the flesh, we're not always used to Living in a manner where we don't live by our emotions, where we don't live by feelings, where we live by the word said this, I'm doing it. And there's some areas in my life where I'm str I struggle. Like the Bible says, do this. And my feelings are like, no, nah, bro, we ain't doing that, homie. We ain't doing that scripture. No, we ain't. No, nah, we, we, we can do some other scriptures. Jesus wept. We can cry, but we ain't going to, we, no, nah, we ain't doing that. But it comes this time. That's why that's why Paul talked about crucifying the flesh. I'm in. I'm the, I'm the boss. When even think about the message when we talk about who's the boss, you know, I'm the boss. I'm not going to let my feelings and emotions dictate how I believe or how I feel. But if we take a step back, come on, we take a step back and see if we're in the faith. And check yourself. Inventory. Examine yourself. It talks about that. Paul talks, speaks about that. Examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. If you take a step back and examine yourself, you may say, you know what? A lot of my decisions in a day are based on my emotions. They ain't, there's no rational thought behind what I'm doing. It's based on how I feel about what I'm doing and whether or not, if I feel like a certain way, then I'm going to do it. That's not how we can live. We can't live by emotions. So we have to learn as we're in Christ to learn a different way. If we love God, we got to obey him. So then we have to be able to do the work. Do the, sometimes it's hard work. 
Because the flesh ain't going down without a fight. Satan ain't going down without a fight. Come on now. The flesh is going to fight you. You will fight you to probably your last dying breath. But you're like, no, we're going to do what God says. And we're going to crucify the flesh. We're going to walk after the spirit. Satan ain't going to be like, oh, man, I'm so glad that you want to live for God. Oh, go, oh, man, you got this. Go right on ahead. I, I, I'm not going to even get in your way. You know, said no one in the dark, in the, in the pits of darkness. No, that ain't how it goes. Satan be like, you want to do right? Okay, I got you, homie. I'm going to bring this person. I'm going to remind you of this. I'm going to remind you of what this person did. I'm coming for you. Because you mine. And you ain't, and you, I'm not going to give you the opportunity to live any other kind of way. I'm saying they ain't going to just let you live for, live for God. There's a hedge of protection around most of us, probably all of us, to live for God. So when the hedge of protection is around us, think about that with Job. Like, look, I can't, God's probably like, look, I, you know, Satan probably like, look, I can't touch certain parts of this person's life. But I touch his mind. I'm gonna remind him of things, or I'm gonna bring this bad person into his life, a hurting person that hasn't resolved what they got going on. They gonna hurt him. They gonna be right where I want him. They ain't gonna forgive. And when they don't forgive, I got him. They'll be in church doing all this stuff. Then all of a sudden, Matthew 7, 21 and 23, they, they'll, they'll die and, and be before the Lord. Lord, Lord, you know, have I not done all these things in your name? You know, and he's like, wait for me. I know you're not. Why you didn't want to forgive? Why you didn't want to live for God? We're doing a lot of churchy stuff. That's why we talk about at Village Hills, we want to make disciples. We ain't trying to make church goers. You know, and that's where the struggle is, trying not to do the same thing that everybody else is doing, but doing it the way God called us to. God has called us. He's commissioned us to make disciples of all nations. He didn't say make church goers. There is a big difference, y'all. There is a big difference. I don't mean to yell. Hold on. I get emotional, y'all. Emotional. All right. All right, but there's a big difference between a churchgoer and a disciple. There's a big, big difference. And we want to make disciples, not churchgoers, not church attendees. And so there's a difference. And so we have to make sure we're structuring that. But if I want to be a disciple, I got to be willing to do the work. And sometimes the work is hard. I got to stay, keep it in front of me. So when I thought about that, like going back to my father, when, and I shared this, this story several times, but when, I, when it came down to it, um, you know, God told me that my father was doing the best he could with what he had. And then he said, well, Hamp, can you forgive your father? Knowing that, knowing that you may not agree with what he did or how he did it. He didn't meet your expectation. But can you forgive him because he was doing the best he could with what he had and what he knew? I said, yes, Lord, I can, I can forgive my father for that. Because God, even though I didn't talk to my father, I'm telling you seven, probably about Maybe about 10, 11 months before my father passed away, I was at his, I was at his house. We sitting in the living room talking. And my father told me, Hamp, I did the best I could with what I had. He repeated the exact same words that God told me in the 90s. By about 20 years later, God, he told me the same thing. A set of understanding that even though I didn't agree with that, the way he did it because he didn't meet my expectation. He did the best he could with what he knew. And a lot of times people are doing the best they can with what they know. But some of those people are hurting. Some of those people are in pain. They've experienced trauma that they haven't dealt with themselves. And because they haven't dealt with the trauma themselves, they go out to hurt people out of that same trauma, out of the same bucket. They think that they, the bucket that they think they've hidden away, they're drawing out their decision making. They're drawing out how they're going to live. They're drawing out how they're going to think about people. And when you think about this, let's go to Titus. I want y'all to see this real quick. Um, Titus 1 and 15 and, uh, 15 and 16. I really like, um, did I get this? Um, uh, Titus uh, 15 and 16. I like the living Bible version of it. I don't think I have this. I don't have this Bible, this version, but uh, in, in Titus 1, 15 and 16, it talks about how they color. He uses the word color. And I, I really like that. That version. I, I may read that. Let me see if I can find it. I got to go to one of my other notes here. Um, color always sees in here. So in Titus, I appreciate y'all. But that that one. Um, so in Titus 15, this is I'm just going to read 15 in the living in the in the, um, the living Bible. And then I'll read uh, 16. And then, then we'll close this out. So then it says a person. Who is of heart, a pure, who is pure of heart, sees goodness and purity in everything. 
But a person whose own heart is evil and untrusting finds evil in everything for his dirty mind and rebellious heart colors all he sees and hears. Excuse me. A lot of us are right here. And verse 16 says, such people claim they know God, but they deny him by the way they live. They are detestable and disobedient, worthless for doing anything good. If we think about it, y'all, some of us are in that same category, including myself. When I don't want to be pure of heart in a situation, when I want to be untrusting or thinking evil about others or not doing what God says, an unbelieving heart, come on, untrusting. If I'm untrusting, that means I don't trust God. I don't trust God's plan. I don't trust God's word. Come on, y'all. I'm talking about being honest here. We need to be, ain't nobody getting free without no honesty. You got to be vulnerable and transparent. Y'all can't hear from, I can't hear from y'all, but I'm going to be honest and transparent. There's some times when I'm not where I need to be. I'm not trusting God in a certain manner. I'm struggling with it, but I got to stay there. See, when I'm, when I, when I, when I, when I say, okay, look, God says do a certain thing a certain way. I'm like, look, Lord, I'm struggling with that. I don't want to do that. I tell, I tell the Lord, like, Lord, I don't want to do that. I don't think, I was telling somebody yesterday, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can do it that you call me, but then I got to keep that in front of me. I got to keep going to God because he got to work on my heart. I need him to work on my heart. I, this, this is the process where I'm asking him, Lord, search me. Try my heart. Know my thoughts. Know, know what's in me, Lord. See if there's icky, any wicked way in me. Clear, cleanse it, Lord. Cleanse me of this way because I don't want to be in a part, a part where I allow a dirty mind and a rebellious heart to color everything I see. So when you have unforgiveness, you live in hate, you're operating in hate, you won't love, you have the potential to allow your a dirty mind and a rebellious heart to color everything you see. So then I see everything through the lens of hate. I see everything. It's like looking at colors. You think about back in the day when we used to watch black and white TV and then Technicolor came out. It's the difference. Now everything is muted. All I see is black and white. All I see is, is hurt and pain. I, everything. It says it colors everything you see and hear. So even through what you hear, someone says, I love you. You're like, you don't love me. You, you say you love me, but you don't. You're like, I care for you. I'm trying to do something nice for you. Oh, you ain't trying to do nice, something nice for me. You're trying to do that for yourself. You ain't trying to do nothing for me. I know what you do. I know who you are. Is that not, am I not speaking true? Come on, y'all. This is how we act. This is how, where I've been at sometimes. So then when you look at verse 16, it says, such people claim to know the God. I claim to know him. But my lifestyle, how I live, says that I deny him by the way I live. Because if I may not, some people don't want to think of themselves as, as detestable, but let's not say this detestable. But, but that's what the words say. But you are disobedient. And then it says worthless for doing anything good. That's not where we want to be. We got to be able to cleanse our heart. We got to be able to change the way we see. We see things. I need to be pure in heart. And oftentimes I need to look at it from a perspective of love. When you think about, excuse me, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. When he looked at the world and saw sin, he saw destruction. He saw people operate evil while they were yet sinners. Christ died for them, for the ungodly. Right. While I was in the midst of sin. Come on. God, Jesus found us. Now, now there are some people Jesus probably find in the church doing good. But but, you know, when I, when I was found, I was I was doing bad. I wasn't trying to be good. I was trying to live my best uh, dirty life possible, sinful life. I was trying to be a good sinner. I was trying to be good at sinning when he found us, when he looked past my sins, he looked past your sins. That's what love does. Love. Over, love covers a multitude of sins. If I'm operating in love, I begin to overlook, I begin to cover the sin. The, the Proverbs talk about it's to my glory to overlook an offense. To my glory to overlook an offense. But when we hold on to it, we want to hold on to what people did to us. There's no glory in that. We want revenge. We want to see people pay for what they did to us instead of seeing mercy and kindness. So number five, there's actually five points, y'all. I think I said four, but it's five. So the last point, and then we're going to close this thing out, um, is, is what to do if you're struggling to forgive. So now I gave all the points, right? I gave these four points. And, and, and these points is what I use. I, I wrote a book about it. Where is this book at? 
Now the book probably need a little bit of updating, so I don't talk about it too often. But it's called Forgive. If you if you actually if you talk to me, if you send me an email, because it does need to be updated. I think there's some good information in there. I, I've been wanting to update it. But if you reach me, reach out to me, or even uh, put a note in here in the comments, put a note in the comments on Facebook, send me a book. I will send you a free copy of Forgive. But the, but the book, the information is in here, and I do talk about separating emotions from from, um, from truth, but there, there are some things I've experienced since then that I really want to get after. I want to I want to update this book really really badly, but I don't feel like it's the time. I tried once and it was it was a it was a challenge. So then you understand sometimes when God is is like um, not frustrating. That's not the right word. Excuse me, but when something seems very confusing and it seems all jumbled, it may not be the time. So um, so I left the book as is. But if you want a free copy of this book, just shoot a message. You can send it in the comments. Send me a book and I will send you a free PDF of, of this book. It's called Forgive Living from the Living Free from the Pain of Offense. So I, so that, that'll be free for y'all. Just put it in the comments that you want a free copy of the book and we'll send it to you. So here's some things to do. What to do if you're struggling to forgive. So if you're struggling to forgive, right? The number one thing is that we lose sight of. Uh, love or don't appreciate the forgiveness that we've received, right? And this is going back to the parable. He was forgiven of a debt that it would take him probably two lifetimes to pay. He could not pay it in his lifetime. But then he went out and someone owed him a day's wage compared to a lifetime of wage. And he didn't understand. He didn't appreciate that, right? We've been forgiven of a debt that we can not, we can never pay. We, we don't, we can't, we can never pay the price that Jesus paid for our sin. We can't do that. So what we have to be able to do, y'all, is be able to understand and we're, we have to go to God with all the steps I talked about. We got to keep going back to him and casting all our cares on him. Talks about this in first Peter five and seven. Right. I got to keep telling him my honest opinion, my honest feelings. Like, Lord, I hate this person. I don't want to forgive him. I know what your words say. And I'm struggling with that. I need some help. Lord, I want to see them, you know, if, tell them how you feel. I want to see them, you know, some people, I want to see them die. I want to, I want to choke them to where I see the last breath leave their body. I see the goat, the, I see the, I see the breath gone. I see it's out of them. I see it, it's gone. I, yes, I, that's what I want, Lord. I want to see them die. I want to see them, I, you know, not that you're going out to do that now, right? I'm not talking about going out and doing something, but some of us have those feelings in our heart. We're harboring death of others in our heart. We're harboring pains in our heart that we need to, we need to give to God. We need to cast those things unto him. That's what David did through the Psalms talking about where I'm at. You got to be honest and vulnerable with the Lord and truthful about where you're at. And this is what I talked about in Psalm 139, um, uh, 23 and 24, allow him to search your heart, to know your thoughts in your heart. Let's go there real quick. Psalm 139, 23 and 24. I pray this is, is blessing you. This is, I mean, this has been my path. This has been the way, when you talk about forgiving people, this has been my path. I mean, I you, I personally, Hamp Lee III has used this several times to forgive others that have hurt me. So, I, so I'm not telling y'all nothing I haven't used before. If y'all ever seen them commercials of the guy that was um, using the, the hair loss and he's like, like I'm not just the, the CEO or I'm not just the owner, I'm the client. You know, there, there we go. All right, Psalm 23, 24, and then we're going to talk about one more thing we got. All right, so then it says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So this process is one of humility. I have to be able to humble myself to say that maybe I'm not right. Maybe, I'm, maybe in this situation is me. You know, sometimes when someone hurts us, we just want to keep thinking about what they did. But sometimes in that process, I got to think about what I did. Maybe I hurt somebody. Maybe I'm not. I'm so prideful and, and so uh, blinded by wanting revenge and see vengeance happen that I'm not willing to humble myself to forgive. So sometimes the process, the, the issue and fault is with me. So I got to be willing to admit that. So being able to do that, to go, God, God, search my heart. God, like him, you won't forgive because you mad. You want to see them pay. There's some people I want to see pay. Come on, man. there's been some people I didn't want to forgive. Some people lied on me, said something wasn't right. I want to see them pay for what they did. I want to see the right, the wrong writing in front of the people that they did. They said all that stuff too. 
I may never get that. <laughs> but I need to forgive. I need to say what's right. I need to forgive. Not because I have to put vengeance in his hands, because that's what he said. He said, vengeance is the Lord's and he'll repay. And there's sometimes when God wants to repay with mercy and that ain't got nothing to do with me. And so I, but I have to understand that God's given me mercy and grace too. So he's trying to lead us on this path in this way of everlasting to let go of every weight and sin. It talks about this in, in Hebrews, lay aside every weight and sin that so easily besets us. Lay aside those things so that you can live holy for God. That's what he wants for me. That's what he wants for you. And then lastly, just ask him for a clean heart and a right spirit. It speaks about this in Psalm 51 and 10. Because this is where it all grows from a place of humility. All of us have the ability to be able to forgive someone who hurt us. And as I shared a little bit before, it's about us really being able to make a decision to separate ourselves from our emotions and from truth. They cannot. Sometimes we have truth and emotion like this. And, but the emotions will overwhelm it. As I said a little bit earlier, it's going to overwhelm it and it's going to smother the truth so that it can't breathe. It can't be able to speak and, and share and be in the light. But when I take away the emotion, then the truth has an opportunity to speak, to free us, right? To be free. So I'm not walking around with a fist everywhere. Think about if you walked around all day with your fist balled up, ready and mad. How many times, how long have we walked around mad and angry, ready to punch people? Like that, who, I don't want to wake up like that every day. Sometimes we wake up like that. We walk through the day like that. We go to bed like that. We go to bed mad every day, angry at people, ready to fight somebody because we won't release it. We won't let go. We won't give those things over to God. We're, our bodies aren't meant to hold that type of stuff. That's why the spirit brings this stuff up, like messages like this to bring it up so we can forgive, so we can cast this stuff off of us and we can be the people that God wants us to be, be the children he wants us to be. So we can reflect his nature and character, right? We can reflect his love. Even in the midst of someone hurting us, even in the midst of someone doing us wrong, we can still say, I forgive you. And that's it. Not I forgive you, dot, 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 but I forgive you, but I forgive you, yes, and no, I forgive you and walk away. And even though the story that was told is wrong or incorrect, because even like with Jesus, you know, we think about some people say he's a wine bibber and a glutton, right? A, a friend of sinner. He wasn't walking around trying to correct everybody. He was living his life. He was living. He was focused on purpose. Some people are going to believe what they want to believe. That's their, that's what they're going to believe. Walk away from it, y'all. Walk away from trying to make sure every single person is going to believe a certain way about you. You got to walk away. Some people are going to believe a lie. They're going to, that's just what they're going to do. Lord, help them. I pray that you help them. <clears throat> help them find the truth. Help them to find peace. Help them to heal. We can pray for them. But I'm going to make a choice. I want you to say today, I'm going to make a choice to forgive the person who hurt me. Even if that's not this second, go to God and say, Lord, I need help. I need help to forgive. I want to forgive this person, but Lord, I've been struggling and, I, and it's been hard And, I, and I, I, because I hate them. I hate what they did to me. I hate how they hurt me. I hate what they said. I hate what they're doing. Tell God what's in your heart. Get all the stuff out. Cast every care and concern onto him. Every time you even think about it, cast it off you. Don't live. Don't, don't live. You know, sometimes when we drive, we be thinking about stuff, thinking about people, thinking about wrong things, you know, and it's meditating in us. It's, you know, as you continue to repeat a matter, it's like you're laying on another brick on top, another brick on top, another brick on top. Nah, I won't take the bricks off. Cast it off. Oh Lord, as soon as that thought come up, nope, oh, nope, nope. Back to God. Send it like the, the, um, the, the praise, the praise post office. You want to just deliver it off. You know, let praise be your weapon. Let worship be your weapon. Continue. Praise, praise them. Get that stuff off you. No, I don't want that. Help find a way. And these are the steps that you do so. So I pray God blessed you through this message. It definitely blessed me as a, a reminder because God wants me to be free. And there's situations and things in my life that I'm still dealing with. And I'm a person. I'm, I'm not going to get no excuse because I need to forgive, right? So I'm working through that. I talked about that a couple weeks ago. Walking through it. God used this message to remind me again, reminding me of the book. Forgive. You got to separate feelings from emotions to be able to do so. Excuse me. So I can walk in the positions that God wants me to walk in. And so can you. So I wanted to share this message with you. So I pray that God bless you through the message. I pray that you was challenged. I pray that you was connect, commit, uh, convicted. 
but most of all, that you'll be committed to the path that God shows you to be free of unforgiveness and to walk in love and peace with those, but not only yourself, but those that are around you and to be at peace with God so that you'll both have this connection of love and one that will never be separated. And so you'll never be separated with God from God because of unforgiveness. So with that, let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you for this time you've given us, Lord God. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity to learn about how we can forgive those who hurt us, Lord. The pain is real, Lord God. The experiences are real, Lord God. The memories are real, Father. But help sever those, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Cover us with your blood, Lord God. Help us to live in such a manner, in such a way, Lord, that we'll forgive those who hurt us, Father God. Show us the path, Lord God. Help us to remove ourselves from our emotions, Father God, that we'll make rational decisions, we'll be self-controlled, we'll gird the loins of our mind, Lord God. Help us, Father God. Search us, Father God. Pull out every memory, every um, every opportunity, every experience of unforgiveness, Lord God, that we may be whole and be free. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your love for us. I thank you for your mercy, Lord God, sir, that's renewed every day. Thank you, Father, for giving us this opportunity to yet have this, this chance to forgive and an opportunity to share love, Lord God, to one another. Father, we love you and we ask for your help today, Lord God, to forgive people from our heart. We love you and we bless you, Father. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Pray. Amen. Amen. I pray that the Lord bless you today, as I said, and uh, just continue to pray for us as we will pray for you. Um, this week, I said, well, actually today at two o'clock, we have our women's meeting life club. So uh, we shared that in the in the message. So please just re uh, review it again. Um, so we have the as far as the phone number. Well, we'll have our Bible study on Facebook at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time on Wednesday. And then we're starting up our, our men's study on uh, Saturdays at eight in the morning. So we'll have just some discussions about men and about how to live as faithful men unto God and really having we're not taping. That was not going to be taped. But we don't take that one in case we share anything that's that's extremely sensitive. So we want to be sensitive to that and give men a space to be able to share. And that's why we don't take the women's messages either, because we want to give men and women uh, separate opportunities to be able to share the, and be vulnerable and transparent and be honest. Because that's where deliverance dwells in, in connections of honesty, vulnerability, transparency. And honesty, we have to have those. And when you have those and you have that connection and communication, we can walk together to know that we're not alone in this. We're with Jesus. He's with us and he's helping us. And we help one another to lift one another up so that we can be the best versions of ourselves, living our best lives ever in Jesus Christ. So I pray God blesses you and keeps you and that you'll enjoy the rest of your day. And until the next time, keep looking to the hills. God bless you.